All right, so we're gonna talk about fossils and how fossils are best interpreted from the biblical worldview. Personally, I think this is the most important subject in all of creation apologetics, fossils is. I mean apologetics, generally speaking, but uh, this is an extremely, extremely important subject. And uh, so we're gonna do our best to cover this. As uh, again, our main purpose in doing these conferences in creation apologetics, generally speaking, is to strengthen your faith and to prepare you to give answers when ask you when people ask you about your faith you know cuz uh, you know today the scientific community is challenging the history of the bible as we talked about this morning and uh, you say you believe in the bible they're going to right away challenge you on some of these issues well what about evolution haven't scientists proven that uh, proven evolution at this point haven't they proven that we have evolved from ape like ancestors these are the kind of questions you have to address and uh, if we let these questions go unchallenged, if we do not give young people answers to these questions when they hear them, either at secular university, these kind of things, then a loss of faith is, is ultimately going to take place. Because, you know, as Jesus summed it up, he says, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? If we can't believe what the Bible says on historical matters, how are we going to believe what it says on spiritual matters such as salvation? This is a key, key verse for creation apologetics. Just absolutely key. And the reason why it's important, the reason why a loss of faith takes place in people who are ultimately taught evolution as being a fact, as being a... Uh, represent, you know, uh, as an explanation of the life that's on Earth today. Because we all know what evolution is, generally speaking, um, a theory put forth to explain how all life on Earth originated from a common ancestor. That one ancestral cell began a long, formed a long time ago through purely natural processes, and that gradually and slowly over long periods of time, all life on Earth has developed from that one ancestral cell. Life has evolved from simple to more complex forms, greater diversity, greater numbers of organisms have uh, continued to accumulate to what we have today. And the main, and in fact the only support for evolution, comes from the fossil record. Now we, we can see living organisms changing through time. There is a degree of change that takes place, a degree of what you could call evolution does take place. God has created organisms with an amazing ability to adapt. And that adapta adaptation requires some significant changes. Um, but there's clearly a limitation to this. Uh, the, the entire theory of evolution that all organisms on Earth have descended from one common ancestral cell cannot, is not supported by living populations. Because when we look at living populations, we see distinct groups of animals. We can only demonstrate that a, a minor amount of change has taken place some of the most substantial examples of evolution, if you want to call it that, are the breeds. The dog, like your dog breeds and your cat breeds. That's a tremendous amount of change that we can see among all of those dog breeds. And most creationists recognize or acknowledge that the mammalian family level of classification is probably synonymous with what we call the biblical kind. So on board the ark, there was probably just one pair of canines. And all the canines alive today, the wolves and the foxes and the coyotes, and all your domestic breeds have all descended from one pair of, our, of uh, canines that was on board the ark. So we acknowledge that a significant amount of head change has taken place, but our best examples come from the domestic breeds. And there's really nothing else in living populations that can point, we can point to that exceed that amount of change. Okay, So the grand theory of evolution is really only supported by the fossil record. Now, we know, all know what fossils are, these, these uh, remnants of pre-existing life, bones and shells and even footprints, even poo. You can find lots of poo in the fossil record, a, a fossil called a coprolei. I remember one year I saw uh, John Mackay came to our school and uh, gave a seminar, and he brought out some coprolei and passed it around to the students and uh, tell them, okay, take a look at it real close, and you can see there's little red specks in it, having them examine it real close before he told them that what they were holding was uh, fossilized poo. <laughs> that was, that was anyway, 
So uh, fossils are, can, you know, can be footprints, even impressions of leaves, all these kind of things, all these constitute fossils. Even, even track, trackway or tunnels can, uh, are, are fossils. But the, these fossils are a record of history, a record of history that is preserved in layers of rocks. Just like tree rings record a sequence of events, or ice, the rings in ice cores record a sequence of events, these layers of rocks that we see also record a sequence of events, meaning a layer that's below another must have been formed first. So this layer formed, and then this layer formed on top of it, the layer that's on top of it formed next. So you have a sequence of events that have taken place. And the fossils that contained within them were fossilized at different relative times to one another. So it is a recording of history. Thus, we call it the fossil record. But the fact that these rocks that fossils are found in form in watery environments, form in water, sandstone, limestone, and shale are the three main types of sedimentary rocks that fossils are found in. These form in water. And that very fact leads us to draw an association with the, with the global flood, that the fossil record, that was just an automatic assumption that most people, most people drew, that was that these layers of rocks that we see fossils in and all of those fossilized animals that uh, died were, were probably the animals that had died during the global flood. This was a long-standing view. A terrible, terrible flood was sent on the earth, sent to the earth by God to judge the earth for its wickedness. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. What a terrible statement. He regretted that he had made human beings. So the Lord said, I will wipe them from the face of the earth, the human race I have created, and within the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So one person, well, apparently one person alone found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and God instructed Noah to build an ark, gave him the specific specifications on how to build this, and then... The, all of the creatures that moved along the ground came to him to be kept alive. So two of every kind of unclean animal, seven pairs of every clean animal came to Noah. They said they came to you to be kept alive. So the significance of this, though, and the inability for geologists to correctly interpret the record of the flood escapes most people. This is a tremendous act of supernatural intervention. The flood itself was caused by God, an act of supernatural intervention. The reason why the life is on earth today after the flood was because of an act of supernatural intervention. Yet remember, the scientific community has adopted a position of philosophical naturalism. Everything must be explained in terms of natural processes and natural processes alone. But we live in a world with the supernatural history. It is impossible for a naturalist to correctly interpret a world with this supernatural history. Any specific event of a supernatural nature that has occurred in Earth's history cannot be correctly interpreted through naturalism, period. This is an important point, extremely, extremely important point. I want you to stew on that for a little bit and think about that. I put to you that it is impossible for naturalists to correctly interpret the fossil record because of this act of supernatural intervention. Why that's the case, though? What is it that's prevent? I say it's, they're precluded or prevented from correctly interpreting the fossil record because of their philosophical stance. But why? So, stew about that a little bit. I'll, I'll come back to the end. So, these layers of rocks that cover the Earth uh, contain fossils, and uh, the support for evolution comes from the fact that fossils in these layers are sorted meaning that fossils are typically found below or above other fossils. Not always, but there is a general trend that is evident in these layers of rocks. It is this general trend that is used to support evolution, that organisms have evolved from simple to complex forms over hundreds of millions of years is supported alone by the fossil record. 
Okay, simple to more complex forms. And in fact, it was, the, it, it was this, that the fossils are sorted that convinced a great many Christians that fossils could not have formed during the global flood as was long assumed. I guess the general view was that if it, the animals that died during the flood, plants and animals, should have been all jumbled together, that they were sorted. Some fossils found below or above other fossils convinced a great many Christians that the fossil record was not the result of flood and must be in, the earth must be much older than the Bible says it was. So, but if we look at the fossil record correctly and examine it for the features it contains in support of the global flood, we can, it, it all makes sense. This sorting as well. And, but this is how the fossil record is used to support evolution. Prentice Hall Biology is uh, the most commonly used biology textbook used in public schools today, without a doubt. And they summarize the uh, fossil records use in supporting evolution this way. By Darwin's time, scientists knew that fossils were the remains of ancient life and that different layers of rocks had been formed at different times during Earth's history. Darwin saw fossils as a record of the history of life on Earth Darwin, like Charles Lyell, proposed that the earth was many millions rather than thousands, like the Bible says, of years ago. During this long time, Darwin proposed that countless species had come into being, lived for a time, and then vanished. By comparing fossils from older rock layers with fossils from younger rock layers, scientists could document the fact that life on earth had changed over time. But this was a terrible, terrible event. Um, a terrible event. Again, looking at Genesis 7. And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heavens were covered. The waters prevailed upon the mountains, covering them by 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that move upon the earth, and every man. Everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. A terrible event. Everything died. All the high mountains and the whole heavens were covered. And geologists say there has been no global flood. Period. There has been no event like this. So, and we looked at this morning as to why that, I mean, the scripture just cannot be supported, cannot be used to support that this flood was a local event. So if we are to trust in the Bible as authoritative on early Earth history, trust it that there was a global flood that is unrecognized by geologists, you know, we should then conclude that geologists have misinterpreted the fossil record and examine it with great skepticism. So evolution generally views fossils this, this way. Fossils show that organisms evolved by natural processes and were buried in watery sediments over great ages. Whereas if we examine fossils from the biblical worldview, they are the remains of organisms that were created by God and were buried in watery sediments by Noah's flood, the two general perspectives. We want to look at these one at a time. Does the fossil record better support the biblical worldview of a global flood or does it better support evolution, the, the change, the, in, the evolution of organisms from simple to more complex forms over hundreds of millions of years? Which does it better support? So we'll look at these one at a time. First, we'll look at uh, fossils as evidence of a global flood. Now, one, probably the most astounding piece of evidence that suggests a catastrophic nature of the fossil record is the extent to which these layers cover the earth. These layers that you see in Grand Canyon, the layers of rocks that uh, contain fossils, are laterally continuous. One of the laws of stratigraphy is known as the law of lateral continuity, which, me, which basically states that these, the layers of rocks that contain fossils basically extend forever until they are either truncated by some geographic, uh, geographical barrier or taper off at the continental shelves. A great many of these layers can be traced all the way across North America. Now, not all of them, because some of them have definitely been uh, um, uplifted or eroded away, these kind of things. But there's the Grand Canyon and the layers of rocks that are exposed in the Grand Canyon and where these can be traced from Arizona all the way to Utah. The layers of rocks that contain fossils are vast in the extent to which they cover continents. Yet we cannot find sediments forming like that today. 
Sediments are the particulates that are eroded by actions such as uh, water and wind, the little particulates that are being carried by a stream, and when that stream empty, empties into a large body of water, its velocity slows and the sediments that it was carrying will fall out of solution and form what's called a river delta. A big fan-shaped deposit will form right there. Other, they form in other ways, but generally they're very localized, very form in very limited spans. They don't cover in hundreds of miles of space like this. Certainly, but this is kind of the common theme for the fossil record, that these layers of rocks cover vast, vast areas. Much more consistent with a catastrophic, major catastrophic model for their origin. We also see ocean fossils everywhere. Ocean fossils can be found throughout the fossil record. They can be found on the tops of virtually every mountain chain in the world, the Andes, Alps, etc. We can find marine fossils. Travel up to the top of the Alps and you can find your little seashells and stuff up there. That these fossils are on the tops of mountains can be explained because we know that mountains build. These plates, continental plates, when they push up against one another, can eventually, one that was down low underneath a, you know, a floodplain or underneath the ocean, can eventually be pushed up and become the top of a mountain over time. We know this can take place. Okay, but it's not just that they're on the top of, a, of mountains, that is the issue. Ocean fossils or marine fossils are found throughout the fossil record. Every single layer of the fossil record contains abundant marine fossils. And this is very puzzling. It, the only explanation is that the oceans must have come in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out over and over and over again throughout the history of life on Earth. This is generally explained by, as being the result of in, repeated ice ages. Ice age calms, ocean levels fall, ice age melts off, they rise back up, and so that's one of the main reasons why they claim there's multiple ice ages. But this is very, very puzzling, that ocean fossils are found throughout the fossil record like this. Unlike this idealized diagram that you see here, the real fossil record is mostly marine organisms. 95% of all fossils are marine invertebrates, primarily shellfish. 95% of the remaining 5% are plants. 95% of the rest are fish. Most of the rest are insects. Far, far less than 1% of these are actually vertebrates, land vertebrates. And when we find them, we most often find them associated with marine fossils. We also find fossils that are extremely well preserved, extremely well preserved. Fish like this, that, whose skeletons are fully articulated or still all attached together, flesh and all, fossils like this are very, very common. But does, is, does the mechanism through which fossils are formed expect us, do we, do we expect to find fossils like, like this based on the mechanisms that, that are generally used to explain how fossils form? I took this off of a, just a secular fossil website just to, just to read, read through how fossils are generally claimed to be formed, and it's like this. After death, the ammonite, that little squid-like creature, cephalopod right there, slowly sinks to the sea floor. Scavengers feed on the fleshy body of the creature, and after only several weeks, all that remains is the shell. Several months after death, the shell gradually becomes covered with silt and sand. These layers continue to build, providing a shield around the shell and protecting it from damage. Time continues to pass and more and more layers are deposited. After a few hundred years, the shell is several feet beneath the surface. Gradually, the chemicals in the shell undergo a series of changes. As the shell slowly decays, water infused with minerals passes through it, replacing the chemicals in the shell with rock-like minerals such as calcite, iron, and silica. Over millions of years, the original shell is completely replaced by the minerals, and what remains is a rock-like copy of the original shell. The fossil has the same shape as the original object, but it's actually rock. So this is the general scenario put forth to explain how fossils form. But, and note that there are two things, back, back up, two things that are required for fossilization to take place. One, normal decomposition has to be arrested has to be slowed to the point where it stops. And that is accomplished by burial. If something dies up on the surface, it's decomposed. Scavengers will pick it apart, 
a bacterial fungi will make short work of the rest, and it becomes dust in the wind. For something to be fossilized, number one, normal decomposition has to be rested. It has to be buried before it would had, had a chance to decompose, number one. Number two, water that it has saturated with minerals has to have ready and continuous access, trickling through that, the remains of that animal continuously until those minerals eventually replace the bone, shell, and other things. Two things. You have to be buried and you have to have water continuing to pass through that for fossilization to take place. Nonetheless, that's the scenario of how they say fossils form. But a fish, when it dies, isn't gonna sink down to the sea floor like this and remain there as it slowly becomes covered with sediment and then eventually become a fossil. Like I say, organisms when they die are picked apart by scavengers, the skeleton will become disarticulated and the rest will be turned into dust by your decomposers, bacteria and fungi, etc. For a fossil like the one we just saw of that fish to be fossilized, it has to be buried rapidly and was probably buried, probably killed by the sedimentary flow that ultimately buried it, preventing its decomposition and later allowing it to be fossilized. This is a much more much better scenario to explain fossils like that and how they form. And we find lots and lots of fossils in the fossil record that are extremely well preserved like that. It's a, a fossil of a fish that's actually in the process, was buried by sediments and later became a fossil before it had time to finish its meal. Notice it has a fish in its mouth. This fossilized ichthyosaur, an extinct type of a shark, was actually buried by sediment, became a fossil before it had time to finish giving birth extremely well preserved animals can be found in the fossil record very very delicate structures wings such detail that we can identify them by species even the most delicate of wings and eyes are preserved in the fossil record animals that are extinct we learn about them their fossils are so well preserved the try to bite an extinct animal had very unusual compound eyes, we know what its eyes were like. We know how, how its eyes were designed by studying its fossils. They're so well preserved. This one was buried by sediments, but before it had time to pull in its eye stalks. We know what animals ate by examining their stomach contents. This hadrosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur, was once thought to live down by the water's edge, sifting through mud with uh, its duck-bill-like mouth, until its stomach contents revealed that it was actually eating mountainous type of uh, food. So we believe that these are now mountain creatures. This hadrosaur, by the way, is close to 50 foot long. In 2005, a T-Rex thigh bone was being transported and it was dropped and broke open and what was found inside was soft, stretchy tissue that when treated could be stretched and would snap back. Upon uh, further analysis, blood vessels, branching blood vessels were found Objects that were believed to be red blood cells were analyzed and all tests to date were consistent with the findings that indeed hemoglobin was present within those objects. One of the best preserved fossil beds that has been discovered is up in what's called the Burgess Shale of British Columbia. A short clip here. There in Burgess Shale, especially the lower level which Walcott first exploited, the preservation is miraculous, it's astonishing. We find trilobites, of course, but we find many, many other sorts of arthropods, almost none of which are ever found in a typical Cambrian assemblage. So we can treat them effectively as being soft-bodied. They have almost no chance of being fossilized in normal circumstances. Geologists believe that the animals of the Burgess Shale were buried quickly and alive by an avalanche of sediment that created an airtight tomb and prevented the decay of soft body parts like eyes, legs, and internal organs. Now in the animal Morella, very often there's a sort of what we call a dark stain. And I find this very intriguing because that dark stain evidently is the body contents are oozing out. So in other words, the animal is beginning to decay and then something stops it. On many of the arthropods, we have the most delicate uh, branches and you can see every single fine hair along them quite astonishing similarly the antennae going out like that 
In particular instances we have some worms, so we see the outside of the body, we can see various things at the front which enable the worm to burrow through the sediment. But then you look at the animal itself and you can see this sinuous reflective line and of course you say, oh, that's the gut, that's the alimentary canal. And then in certain cases you actually look at one part of the alimentary canal and you can actually see food inside it, shellfish which is swallowed. It is a remarkable insight into a fossil you'd never expect to be fossilized. So extreme preservation of animals definitely is more consistent with a rapid burial, catastrophic burial of these, rather than slow and gradual burial by normal mechanisms, the kind of mechanisms we see now as rivers are depositing their sediments. We also find mass mortality fossil beds that are clearly formed through catastrophic events. But in the past, there have been some ridiculous explanations for some of these. They have found like caves full of rhinoceros and, and huge, uh, what they used to call graveyards, elephant graveyards. They would find enormous beds of elephant bones all in one location. They would call these graveyards. And one of the explanations was that this was just a traditional place where the elephants would go to die. <laughs> die. As if, you know, someone gets old and you're just going to walk off and where your, where your mom had died and wait there until you become... I mean, it's ridiculous, you know? Such an explanation uh, to, other than just to accept the obvious. But we see lots and lots of these mass mortality beds. Whole communities of fossils, entire populations of fossils, all buried together, highly well, very well preserved. Oftentimes we find these fossil beds oriented. These are all pointing in the same direction, indicating that the sediments that buried them were all flowing rapidly. One term that's been recently used to uh, describe a certain type of fossil bed is a log jam bed. What these are believed to be is a mass of animals that were being carried downstream and eventually got jammed up like a log jam forms when uh, timber used to be transported down rivers, called a log jam bone bed. In Australia, the Lark Quarry Dinosaur Trackway is a famous trackway of dinosaurs that has historically been claimed to be a whole bunch of dinosaurs, like 150 dinosaurs that were running away from a predator, tr walked, uh, tr had run through this one particular area. The entire bed is now enclosed in a conservation slash museum that's shown there. 4,000 footprints made by 150 or more dinosaurs are all found in this bed. Well, very recently, in January 2013, researchers at the uh, University, of, University of Queensland, um, after analyzing these uh, tracks, asserted that these animals had, these tracks had formed when these animals were underwater, or at least mostly buoyant, so that they were swimming, able to touch the bottom, but just barely. So all that, the tracks were mostly just the tips of their toes, showing that they were clearly buoyant at the time. I mean, it's just kind of interesting more than anything else, that maybe instead of these uh, dinosaurs running from a predator, they were instead possibly running from uh, rising floodwaters. So. Uh, one other type of fossil that uh, is uh, very interesting is a, a fossil that's in what's called a death pose. A lot of these serpents, these long neck, long tailed dinosaurs like this one here can be found with their head arched back, showing that they were in a state of struggle at the time they were buried by sediments and uh, then died. And after, after this was first brought to my attention, I started looking around at these and I realized just how many of these have been found. An enormous number of these fossils that are referred to as death poses have been discovered. Mo most of the Archaeopteryx I were able to find are in this position. So Archaeopteryx are one of the fossils that are claimed to be a you know, half reptile, half bird kind of transitional form. But it's very interesting you see them in this, in this death pose. Now the Archaeopteryx takes on a new meaning. Instead of being a proof of evolution, actually proof that these animals were, were destroyed in some kind of catastrophe that caused them to lose their life. All right, so let's look at, examine this as far as its proof of evolution is concerned. I think if we look at the fossil record objectively, 
we, we, it just, it, to me, the, it, it speaks of a catastrophe that these animals were buried rapidly. These beds are very, very enormous. And uh, so I think that we can reach the conclusion that they were formed by the global flood. But do they, does it support evolution? Does it really provide the kind of support that evolutionists need to claim their theory to be true? I mean, they claim evolution is an absolute fact and uh, claim that their interpretation of the fossil record is unquestionable. But is it really? Now, again, evolution is the theory that organisms on Earth have developed from simple to more complex forms over long periods of time from a single common ancestral cell referred to as the last universal ancestor. But for this theory to be true, what the fossil record must contain is a series of transitional forms as organisms slowly change through time, adapting to new forms, new habitats by taking on new shapes. This is what the fossil record should contain. But uh, it's interesting that the evolutionist of Darwin's day um, did not, did not, most did not accept Darwin's view. Even, uh, even Thomas Huxley uh, did not accept Darwin's theory of slow and gradual change. Uh, most of the evolutionists of Darwin's day held to what was called saltation. That evolution must occur in jumps. Very rapidly, organisms evolved. Because when they looked at the living organisms that they knew of, what they saw were distinct groups of organisms. And when they examined fossils, what they found were also these distinct groups of organisms. There wasn't just a gradual transition of blending from one type to another, as you would expect if Darwin's theory was true. And his main contribution was twofold, that evolution was slow and gradual rather than in a saltational manner, and two, that natural selection was largely responsible. But most of the evolutionists of Darwin's day held to a different view. That was his main contribution, slow and gradual change. But at the time he published The Origin of Species, the fossil record simply did not support his view. And he knew this. And actually, in The Origin of Species, there's a carefully worded apology that the fossil record did not support his view. But he assumed that through time, more fo the fossil discoveries would eventually be made to prove his theories true. But they have not. The distinctness of specific forms, and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links, is a very obvious difficulty. I allude to the manner in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. When Darwin was writing The Origin of Species, it was well known at the time that the first fossils of animals appeared suddenly without precursors in the geological record. So there was a deep conflict between what his theory told him to expect to find, namely an abundance of transitional forms going back to that common ancestor for the animals, versus what was there in the fossil record. Darwin knew that if his theory was true, the older rock strata directly beneath the Cambrian layer should reveal a progression of fossils connecting simple earlier forms to complex animals like trilobites through a trail of incremental steps and failed biological experiments. Such evidence would document the trial and error process of natural selection. But Darwin says in the origin, where are these transitional forms? They're not there in the fossil record. What we see instead are fully formed, discrete groups. Now that's a world-class puzzle for someone like Darwin. And this is kind of a common theme for the fossil record. Not only do we not see these slow and gradual progressions represented in rock records, but we have these enormous gaps between organisms. Uh, fi major phyla like the cnidarians and your echinoderms, your mollusks and your arthropods, there is just no indication whatsoever what these evolved from, or for the, furthermore, what they evolved into. Which of these became the first vertebrate? We simply do not know. The fossil record is lacking in these big, big steps. And uh, in general, when we see an animal in the fossil record, what we find is an animal that's fully formed, highly specialized organisms, when they first appear in the fossil record, are perfect. And for many of them, they're exactly the same as those we find today. 
even uh, things like bats and pterosaurs. Evolution teaches that flying animals evolved from land animals, but new discoveries here in Germany are causing problems for this theory. There's a 10 million year period of early mammal evolution where you would guess that there'd be some sort of a bat precursor, but once again, nothing. Bingo, they just show up. Here's a very highly complex mammal with all these adaptations, and bingo, they just show up at some particular moment in time fully formed as a bat. Obviously, we evolutionary biologists and paleontologists don't believe that, but at this point, we don't have a good fossil ancestor for them. This same problem occurs not only for bats, but also for flying reptiles. When the pterosaurs uh, first appear in the geological record, they were completely, uh, they were perfect, they were perfect pterosaurs. These evolutionary lineages are simply missing. Full 150 years after Darwin formed his theories, and although he had predicted that the fossils would eventually be found, they simply have not. Prentiss Hall biology speaks to the absence of transitional forms trying to diminish their significance and offer explanation, but this is what they say. Since Darwin's time, the number of known fossil forms has grown enormously. Researchers have discovered many hundreds of transitional fossils that document various intermediate stages in the evolution of modern species from organisms that are now extinct. Gaps remain, of course, in the fossil records of many species, although a lot of them shrink each year as new fossils are discovered. These gaps, do not indicate weakness in the theory of evolution itself, rather they point out uncertainties in our understanding of exactly how species evolved. Evolutionists are now starting to shift away from what was Darwin's original suggestion that change was slow and gradual and now are asserting that evolution must occur in rapid jumps, a theory known as punctuated equilibrium. So there's a punctuated step, a where a very rapid step where no fossils would be formed and then an equilibrium will be established for a long period of time and at that stage you would get fossils. But it's really no different than saltation, what the evolutionists held to in Darwin's day. We're simply back at that because even though Darwin predicted the fossils would be found, they simply have not. The, these evolutionary trees that you tend to see Simply, if, if you'll take note, you don't see the data there that you would see. You don't see the labels at the branch points, at the major junctions. All you see are labels at the tips. And because what living organisms and the fossil record only show are that there are distinct groups of organisms, between which there are just enormous, enormous gaps. Stephen Jay Gould, who's uh, one of the most popular evolutionists of our, our day, said this. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. The trade secret of paleontology. David Berlinski is a, has received a PhD from Princeton University and has taught at Stanford and Rutgers, uh, City Un University of New York, University of Paris. He uh, has some comments on the absence of transitional forms. The question has to be raised, as it should be raised whenever an evolutionary sequence is mentioned, what are exactly the predicted properties one would expect to find? as one passes from a, a land-dwelling creature to a sea-dwelling creature. Specifically, how many changes are required to go from a creature such as Ambulocetus natans, which seemed to have been a, a land-dwelling creature, to, some, uh, to a creature that spends the entire portion of its life in the ocean? Uh, curiously enough, this is not a question that evolutionary biologists ask a whole lot. I did some uh, seed of the end, back of the envelope calculations myself, and the most modest estimate I could come up with is that um, an organism requires roughly 50,000 morphological changes to adapt itself to the open going ocean. And as soon as we introduce a quantitative estimate, however loose, however flabby, however spontaneous, then a great deal of puzzlement starts to uh, intrude into the otherwise sunny picture. 50,000 changes and we've got two members of a sequence. Where are the other 49,999 members of that sequence if Darwinian changes are incremental and they're small? 
After all, we're not talking about changes that are arbitrary. A creature must have these changes if it's to survive in the open ocean. And any, any attempt to put a quantitative number should induce a profound sense of perplexity because the number of changes are so much greater than anything we see in the transitional record. Now, what is the proper explanation for this? Please understand, I don't have it. But neither do the other guys. Neither do the other guys. And uh, in my opinion, they refuse to recognize the legitimacy of the question. That is a fundamental question in paleontology. How many changes are required? Can those changes be compared to the fossil record? And if they are compared to the fossil record, why do we see such deficiencies in the record as compared to the necessary changes? Very important issues. Very important. I mean, the, the transitional forms simply are not there. The slow and gradual progression that Darwin uh, theorized had happened to explain the life that's now on Earth simply cannot be verified by the way of the fossil record. Instead, what we find are distinct groups of organisms. We also find a great number of just what was called out-of-place fossils. Uh, we have to remember that diagrams like this just are illustrative of a general trend. There is a general trend, a sorting that took place, but you can always find these fossils completely out of place, whole sequences even inverted. But there are some, they can, they can offer explanations for some of these out of place fossils because an original fossil bed can be eroded and then redeposited, mixing together two fossils that weren't originally in the same bed, even completely inverting a previous bed by eroding it from the top, then the next layer, then the next layer, completely inverting the whole thing. So they have explanations for some of these, but some of them they just can't, cannot explain at all. For example, the coelacanth which is uh, shown here in this diagram, was believed to have gone extinct 70 plus million years ago, back at the time of the dinosaurs, and uh, was thought to have been extinct you know, you know, ever since. But in 1938, it was discovered alive and well off the coast of Madagascar, having lived, been living deep in the Indian Ocean. A fisherman pulled it up and a paleontologist was able to recognize it. Now we know where they live and uh, they've caught like 80 of these things now. And uh, so although they've survived this long, they may be one more animal that falls prey to the uh, to mighty hand of man has probably caused most extinctions. But it's, it's also interesting that this was one of the animals that was claimed by evolutionists to be a transitional form. It's a lobe fin fish, Sarcopterygii. It has these big fleshy lobed fins, which would thought to suit this animal well in evolving up into up unto life on land, and perhaps then it actually had evolved into a terrestrial form. But when it was eventually discovered living well, it wasn't living up on the continental shelf where it would use these lobe fins to crawl around on the, instead it was living deep in the Indian Ocean. Not a habitat that would have been likely to have uh, caused this organism to eventually crawl up on land. There are many of these, I'll just give a couple of examples. The Willumi pine was also thought to have gone extinct 150 million years ago until it was discovered in 1994 in the Blue Mountains near, near, near Sydney, Australia. You can now buy Willemi pine shoots and uh, have them delivered. Also, in 2005, this mammal was found with a dinosaur in its stomach. Now, you have to perhaps have a skilled eye to recognize that to be a mess to be a dinosaur, but that's what it is. This thing had a dinosaur in its stomach. And why this was particularly shocking is because when this was discovered, it was believed that mammals of this size did not live at the time of the dinosaurs. We have to understand that those diagrams we see are really just a de depiction of what evolutionists expect from history, what they expect from the fossil record. In order to convince them that their view of the fossil record is incorrect, you literally have to find one in the stomach of another. You know, for them to be convinced that humans lived at the time of the dinosaurs, you will literally have to find a, a human in the stomach of a dinosaur or perhaps vice versa. <laughs> there are also a great number of living fossils. Not only are the coelacanth and the lummi pine living fossils, but we find a great, great number of these. The list that I have here are organisms that are dated to have lived more than 100 million years ago. But this list is extensive. The stingrays that we find in the fossil record are identical to the stingrays we find today. Squids are identical. Lobsters, identical to those we find today. Cockroaches as well. 
shield bugs, or what you might call stink bugs, are identical to those we uh, find today. Frogs, bats, again, lizards, centipedes, spiders, flying ants, snakes, turtles, crickets, scorpions, flies, the list just will go on and on and on. Generally, the animals that we find in the fossil record are identical to living species. And yet, if their assessments on the age of the earth and evolution are true, then these organisms should have changed dramatically over time. Because remember, that one of their explanations for marine fossils being found throughout the fossil record is that the oceans came in and out and in and out. Dramatic ecological changes are believed to have occurred regularly throughout Earth's history. And yet one of the major driving forces for evolution, natural selection, is to adapt to changing environments. That environments have changed this substantially and regularly throughout history, and yet these organisms remain virtually unchanged is a, a dramatic conflict with what the theory expects. Probably one of the most substantial problems with the fossil record in supporting the theory of evolution is known as the Cambrian Explosion called the Cambrian Explosion because at one point in time, life just burst onto the scene. Referred to in this Time Magazine article, Evolution's Big Bang. The Cambrian Explosion was a sudden appearance of life that occurred in the layer of rocks we call the Cambrian. At one point in time, with no evolutionary transitions to suggest where they came from, most of the major invertebrate phyla just appear on the scene in a burst Darwin acknowledged a problem that defied explanation, the Cambrian fossil record. Here the basic body plans of major animal groups that still exist today, and many others now extinct, made their first appearance in the fossil record so suddenly that biologist Richard Dawkins noted, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. The current uh standard estimates for the origin of life put it at about 3.8 billion years ago, let's say 4 billion. So if we start the clock then, our 24-hour clock, six hours, nothing but these simple single-celled organisms appear, the same sort that we saw in the beginning. 12 hours, same thing. 18 hours, same thing. Three quarters of the day has passed and all we have are these simple single-celled organisms. Then at about the 21st hour, in the space of about two minutes, boom, most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. And many of them persist to the present, and we have them with us today. Less than two minutes out of a 24-hour period. That's how sudden the Cambrian explosion was. Since Darwin, excavations on every continent have revealed the magnitude of the explosion of life. An event that was clearly global in scope. Well, a Cameron explosion is exactly what it says it is. It's an explosion. Now, not explosion in terms of pieces of animal flying all over the place. Actually, when biologists talk about an explosion, what they mean is effectively an enormous diversification, what we call a radiation. So we have, during the Cambrian, what appears to be the abrupt appearance of animals. We are filling the barrel with lots of different types of organisms. But we're also inventing nervous systems, we're inventing eyes, we're inventing how to move quickly. So the whole world is speeding up. It's an event where, in many respects, everything changes forever. So if Darwin's theory is true, what we should see from the fossil record is something like this. A gradual increase in complexity, a gradual increase in diversification, a gradual increase in the number of species through time. But what we instead see is this. At one point in time, with an explosion, you have a great number of animals suddenly appearing on the scene with no transitional forms between them, no indication of what they have evolved from. So what does the evidence best support? Does it support evolution? Don't think so. The sudden appearance of life on Earth in the Cambrian explosion, the tremendous absence of transitional forms that we see, out of place fossils that we find, and the abundance of uh, living fossils, all argue strongly against a uh, theory of evolution. Instead, 
The, the fossil record is much more consistent with the global flood model. The lateral continuity of strata, strata that blanket vast surfaces of the earth, the abundance of ocean fossils that we found throughout the fossil record, the highly preserved nature of fossils showing that they were buried rapidly, and the mass mortality fossil beds that we find are much more consistent with the global flood model of the fossil record. The fossil record that you see in diagrams like this is best understood as really a statement of evolutionary thinking and how evolutionists propose the fossil record should be from simple to more complex form. But when the fossil record is interpreted from the biblical worldview, we can see that it's really a sorting that represents the destruction of successive life zones during the global flood. Organisms that live at different habitats, organisms that have different environmental tolerances, organisms that have different abilities to migrate, affected when these animals die during the global flood. And for some, it may very well have taken five months. The flood itself was a long and drawn out event. Life goes on, animals do their best to stay away from it. The reason why humans are absent from the fossil record is probably due to intelligence. Unlike animals that will hurt up and feel protected when things are you know, going wrong, humans will have been able to recognize the event for its significance and acted efficiently to avoid the rising flood waters. If you're not buried by sediment, you won't become a fossil. So ant organisms that died late in the flood would not have been preserved in the rock record and become a fossil. And we've got to remember the testimony of uh, Peter, the prophecy of Peter in 2 Peter 3 through 6. He said that, first of all, you must understand this, that scoffers will come in the last day. He says that they will deliberately ignore this fact, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and an earth formed out of water and by the means of water, through which the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He said that in the end times, people would de deliberately ignore the fact that the world was deluged with water and perished. Now, I gave you a moment to think about this, but I want to address this issue again. Why I believe that geologists cannot correctly interpret the fossil record. They're dedicated to a position of philosophical naturalism that everything we see the earth as it now exists, its origin, its development, and all physical phenomena must be explained in terms of purely natural processes. But the global flood itself was an act of supernatural intervention. God caused the flood, number one, and the organisms that are alive today were, are only here because of a secondary act of supernatural intervention. God told Noah there was going to be a flood, told him how to prepare an ark, brought the animals to him, and they're only here because of that. Now, we've got to remember that a geologist, when they're examining the world, are not just examining the layers of rocks and the fossils they contain, but the world as it now exists. On top of those vast layers of rocks, and you're talking hundreds of feet thick, and place these layers of rocks are kilometers in thickness, blanketing entire continents on top of all of those vast layers of rocks, there is life, fragile life. So... There's only two possible explanations. If those layers of rocks were formed during a catastrophic flood, then they were saved from that flood through some kind of miracle, all right? The only other possible explanation, the only one that a naturalist could reach, is that those organisms survived the formations of these vast layers of rocks on their own through purely natural processes, which means though they formed slowly and gradually over long periods of time. It's impossible for geologists to correctly interpret the fossil record because of the supernatural intervention that preserved the organisms that are now alive. Do you understand that? That is a key point, understanding why they can never correctly interpret the fossil record. Life is only here because it was spared from the flood through an act of inter uh, supernatural intervention. That's important. Scientists are naturalists, but you cannot correctly interpret a world that has a supernatural history through rigid philosophical naturalism. So, I already touched on this, but remember, one of the big debates today between uh, secular scientists and the Bible has to do with the age of the earth. And uh, as we saw this, this morning, the, if the days of creation are literal 24-hour periods of time, and I believe that the exegetical approach to biblical interpretation shows that to be true, 
with the genealogical record, giving us an, a, a very specific chronological dating system, and with the flood itself being the cause of the fossil record that is what is dated by scientists to show that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, there is really no conflict. Nothing that scientists have shown us is really, really conflicts with the biblical version of history. So we need to just trust in the Bible as authoritative on these matters. And remember what the fossil record is. It is a monument, a monument that we should not forget the meaning of. Just like the monument of stones that Joshua and the 12 tribes set up after they crossed the Jordan. When they crossed the Jordan, each of the 12 tribes set up a stone, a little monument, to, as a memorial, as a remembrance of God's hand in guiding them through the wilderness. The fossil record, these layers of rocks that we see are a reminder to us of just how much God hates sin. And we should not forget this. This was a terrible, terrible event brought on by God's judgment. He hates sin so much that he was willing to destroy not only all the humans that were on, life, on earth at that time, but all the animals as well. God hates sin, and we should never, never forget that. And remember what Jesus says. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. If we forget what the meaning of those fossils really is, if we forget that God's judgment has came, came and is coming again, then we'll find ourselves no better off than the people that were outside the ark during the time of the flood. But God sent salvation to Noah and his family. He has sent salvation to us as well. All we have to do is enter and be saved. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that uh, you have provided your word for us that gives us so much insight into the history of our world that through it, we can understand the true history. We would ask for, for wisdom. Father, there's so much information, so much learning, and so much knowledge coming our way. We need your wisdom to help us understand true information from misinformation. Give us the knowledge that we need so that we may be an effective witness for you, Father. We praise you, Father God. We praise your name. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, guys.